May I speak in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This Sunday, we begin a series of readings from the book of Colossians, the epistle to the Colossians. This letter is a bit mysterious. It tells us here at the very beginning that it is written by Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and by Timothy. But throughout the letter, it uses different language and style than other, than other letters that we know that Paul wrote. So this leads biblical scholars to start looking for clues to try to figure out what is going on. And so some scholars say, well, this was a letter that Paul wrote late in his life, when he was near death, during his last imprisonment. Which is why some of the theological themes that we see the kernels of in other letters are now more developed because it's coming at the end of Paul's ministry. Still other scholars, because anytime you have more than one scholar, you'll have more than one opinion. So other scholars think that this might be one of the early pseudographical letters, which is a really fancy word for letters that were written in the name of Paul, but were written by his students after he died. This was a common practice. It wasn't forgery, the, the way we would sort of think of forgery or plagiarism. It was a way that you honored your teacher and you continued their teaching by writing under their name. And so these scholars say, well, this theology that we see in the letter to the Colossians is more progressed and more developed because it's written further along in the church's history when Paul's ideas have now been more formalized by his students and the communities of faith. Whether the letter was written by Paul and Timothy is not the only mystery involved here, but the community that the letter is written to is somewhat clouded by history. Colossae, right, was a relatively small town in what is now the modern-day country of Turkey. It was situated on a river valley. It was part of sort of three smaller towns along a river that was known for making of clothing and fabric. And Colossae specifically was known for producing scarlet dyed wool. This area, in addition to producing fabric, was also known as sort of a mixing pot of spiritualities and philosophies. Because so many tradespeople came and went, there were different mystery religions or different cults to different gods or devotions to astral deities such as the sun and moon and stars. There was also a pretty substantial Greek-speaking Jewish settlement there. So the Christians in that city would have found themselves in sort of this big swirl of ideas and faith. Colossae had at one point in its history been the largest of these three river cities. But by the time Paul or Paul's followers would have been writing to them, it was a city on the decline. A bigger city had developed upriver, and in 61 CE, there was a major earthquake that hit the region, and it seems that Colossae and some of the other small towns never quite recovered from the damage that was done there, and the Christian community sort of disappears into history, and we don't know what happened to it. So it is to a community in decline that this letter is written. And while there's not a list of community errors that we normally see in Paul's letters when he begins to address a community, it seems like this letter was written to oppose the creeping effect of all of those different spiritualities that surrounded the Christian community. 
It's possible that the Colossians were incorporating other practices into their life of faith, making life slightly easier by, you know, offering or participating in rites to celebrate the sun or the moon or or local cultic practices. And so in response to this, they receive a beautifully written argument that presents that the life of faith for a Christian requires Christ and Christ alone. The opening lines of this letter give us clear hint at how Christian practices should be shaped. The writer begins this letter by giving thanks for the Colossians because of their faith in Jesus, for their love of their Christian community, and because of the hope that they project into the world. The community at Colossae, the Christians there, are bearing fruit in their lives and in the community around them. So in addition to giving thanks, the writer makes it clear that Paul and Timothy or whatever Christian leaders might have been writing this are holding the Colossian community in prayer. Now for some of this, this churchy language, I give thanks to God for you, or I'm praying for you without ceasing, maybe seems a bit hollow. We've maybe gotten a little coarse to it, right? Because we hear this language from people that then don't seem to bear fruit in their lives that match the language that they use. They say, I'll be praying for you, but yet we don't experience sort of the marks of the Spirit. We don't experience hope and love and faith for them. And their words of, I will be praying for you, is sort of a way to dismiss us. Within our Christian life, I don't think we nearly often enough tell people that we give thanks to God for them. But these words in this letter are genuine. And they're genuine because they're born out in the actions of Paul and Timothy and the followers of Christ. And they are genuine because they are born out in the life of the community at Colossae. But in the midst of all of this, we get a hint at the struggle. The prayer that is offered unceasingly is that the church in Colossia lead lives worthy of the Lord, that the people there of the Christian community lead lives worthy of Christ, and that they can grow in their knowledge and that they can endure. The Colossians are to endure the temptations of the various spiritualities and philosophies and easy life around them. They are to endure the decline of their city, the loss of their influence, power, and wealth. They are to endure all of this with patience and with joy and with gratitude, knowing that Christ alone is all that they need for redemption. And because they endure, they will bear fruit, not in an effort to earn some future salvation, but with the knowledge that Christ's work is already completed. Christ has already rescued and transferred the Colossians into the kingdom, and Christ has already forgiven their sins. Now, I give this bit of history, this background on Colossians, because I, in reading it and learning it, hear a lot of our modern-day circumstances. We, in various places, are perhaps succeeding in life and doing well, or we may be experiencing decline. We may be at the top of our career, or we may be at the end of our career. We may receive financial benefits or, or be struggling financially. In our communities, we sort of move up and down and what our influence and power might be. But one thing we do share is that we are surrounded by a culture that is filled with different competing spiritualities and philosophies and get well quick schemes and and healthy living ideas and you should do this and that so that you can be a healthier person and you can be happy if you just read this book or do this one thing. Right? But we have a lot in common with that church in Colossae. 
We are experiencing environmental devastation and changes, right? We are living in a time that is uncertain as it was for the Colossians. So they are not so different than us. And so we can hear these comforting words from Paul and Timothy in the early church that writes reminding us that even in this uncertainty and this swirl of different religions and ideas that we can bear fruit because we have faith in Jesus and love for our community and because we are bearers of hope and that other Christians give thanks for us and that we can give thanks for each other to God and that we can continue to lift each other up in prayer. And we are also reminded, just as the Colossians were, that the work of Christ has already occurred. Even in this world of uncertainty, we are called to live lives worthy of Christ because we have already been saved and are already forgiven. Amen.